Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's stand to our feet. We are so glad that you're here today. It's raining outside, but there's joy in this room today. God loves us. Let's sing together. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Sing it with us. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world, sing. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever church thankful today for God's love and in Hebrews it says God has said never will I leave you never will I forsake you so we say with confidence the Lord is my helper I will not be afraid let's sing this together standing on this mountain top Looking just how far we've come Knowing that for every step You were with us Kneeling on this battleground Seeing just how much you've done Knowing every victory Was your power in us 
scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. of who you are and your great love for us. God, it doesn't matter if it's a hard time, a dark time, a fearful time. You have not left us. Yes, God. You are faithful. God, we praise you even when the storms come and the rain and the winds hit hard, God. You are faithful and you did not leave. God, we are standing on your promises today because you are faithful. And we praise you. We praise you. Evermore, God, the song said, evermore we will be breathing out your praise. God, may that be true of us today, that we are breathing out your praise, no matter what. 
No matter what we face, we're breathing out your praise. We're going to praise you, God, and we're going to sing a hallelujah in the dark, through the doubt. We're going to speak to that fear, and we're going to sing hallelujah. So, God, as we continue in worship today, as we continue to raise our voice to you, we are going to raise that hallelujah so that you will be praised no matter what comes our way. No matter what, God. Let us sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to your name, God. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a Praise God. 
in the middle of a storm. I woke up this morning, it was dark, it was gloomy, the rain was coming down, I was like, oh. But to walk in a room like this right now and be able to sing our praises to God deserves a round of applause this morning. I love this place and I'm so glad you're here. I'm Jordan, I'm the kids pastor here. And if you're new around here, we are so glad you're here. Today, we're gonna stop for just a minute and we're gonna pray, so bow your heads. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come and praise your name. Lord, we come with anticipation because we know that you have a fresh word for us today. So Lord, we pause. We ask that you will speak through Pastor Andrew in just a couple minutes. Lord, that you will give us a heart and a mind to hear and understand and comprehend your word today. In your name we pray, amen. You may have a seat. Well, like I said, if you're new around here, welcome. We would love to meet you. So if you'll stop by the Connect Desk on the way out, we have a free gift for you. We also, right after this service, have Next Steps. And this is a great time for you to connect, meet a few of the pastors, be able to find out a little bit more information about the church. So if you will uh, go to the back, you'll be able to find out more about that today. Well, we have had a year where baptisms have been off the charts around here. And we're gonna celebrate that again here in just a few weeks. So if you would like to be baptized, you can go onto our app. You can find out more information about the dates and the times for that. Well, let's jump into our series today with Pastor Andrew. Welcome to Church of the Crossing. My name is Andrew. I'm one of the pastors here. And if this is your first time or if you are new to Church of the Crossing, I'm so glad you decided to be here on Sunday today. And if you are watching online, I want to say welcome. Glad that you're streaming today. Hope that today is encouraging to you as well. I want to start today by asking you, when was the last time you were hangry? You know, hangry, it's hungry and angry, that irritable, frustrated. How many of you have been hangry this last month? Anybody been hangry at all this week? Who's hangry right now? Don't, no, don't, don't, you don't have to, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> we have some donut holes later <laughs> in the lobby. Well, I get hangry really easily. Um, very quickly, I can get hangry. One of my greatest fears in life is to be hungry. That's why I always travel with snacks. If I'm traveling on an airplane or driving in a car, I've got snacks. I've got sandwiches, bars, apples. Um, Just ask the people that I work with. When I come into work during the week, I carry a large cooler bag with my lunch and my snacks. One of my favorite snacks is raw baby carrots. I can put away a bag of carrots in a day. I love carrots because I don't want to be hangry. I'll tell you about a time recently that I got hangry. 
Lauren and I were traveling out west, and we were on a hike in the Rocky Mountains, and we loved to hike. We loved to be out, outdoors, and this hike started off well. Um, we had a clear day. We were in good spirits. It was a little crisp, but we were prepared for that. You can see a picture here of Lauren on the trail. As we made our way to the top of the mountain, uh, the temperature started to drop, and the wind started to pick up. And before we knew it, we were in the middle of a full-blown snowstorm on the top of this mountain. It was a complete whiteout. And we made it to the top just to snap this picture. And I remember Lauren saying, this is not fun anymore. <laughs> our fingers were numb. Our toes were numb. I was hungry. I mean, look closely at my face here. That's the picture of a hangry boy. Now, today's message is not about uh, eating habits or snack habits. Today, I want to talk about the appetite of our souls. Because your soul can get hangry pretty easily. The soul can get irritable, frustrated, weary. Your soul is the essence of your humanity. Your soul is the essence of who you are as a human being. Your soul is connected to your emotions and your feelings. Your soul involves your desires, your passions, your intellect. Even your body and your physicality is a part of your soul. It's a part of the essence of your humanity. And just like we have to feed our body with food, we need to care for our souls. We need to provide for our souls. I'd like to share a few questions with you that you can ask yourself today. These are questions that can help you identify a hangry soul. These questions are, do you often feel anxious or irritable? Do you experience chronic fatigue or illness? Do you often feel guilty about your relationship with God? Do you go through the motions of worship? Do you notice a pattern of neglecting intentional relationships like family or a spouse or your kids? These are just a few symptoms of what may reveal a hangry soul. And even if you're here today, even if you're watching online and, and you're unsure about what you believe about Jesus or not sure what you believe about faith, I think most of us can agree that we've felt the symptoms of a hangry soul before. Even Jesus had a hangry soul. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he was alone in the garden praying and he was, his soul was overwhelmed. We read in Mark 14, Jesus says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. God has created your soul to be connected to him. God has created your soul to be fulfilled and satisfied in him alone. But sadly, our souls are hurting because of the sin and the brokenness of this world. We've all experienced pain and loss. We've all experienced disappointment. We've all had highs and lows. We've suffered, and this brokenness in this world has left our souls longing to be satisfied. But we're separated from God. Our souls need to be reformed, remade. And this is what the big idea is today. This is the main point that I want us to remember. The big idea of this message is this. God can reform a hangry soul. God can reform a hangry soul. God can renew a weary soul. God can refresh a tired soul. God can rebuild a broken soul. So many of us try to satisfy the longings and desires of our souls by working harder, go, 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 achieve more, look perfect, act more productive, be efficient, strive. And there's nothing wrong with a good work ethic, but sometimes we can overwork our souls into a state of chronic exhaustion. Only God can satisfy our souls. Only God can provide the rest and the peace that our souls desperately need. We've been in a message series looking at the book of Nehemiah in the Bible. And we've discovered on this journey that Nehemiah was a great reformer. He reformed the government. He reformed the city of Jerusalem. He reformed the nation of Israel. He was a reformer. And before we continue to talk about reforming our souls today, let me just briefly recap Nehemiah's story. In case you haven't been here for a moment or you're just joining today, let me summarize Nehemiah's story. So Nehemiah was the servant to a foreign king, King Artaxerxes. And one day Nehemiah learns that his home city, Jerusalem, has been destroyed. The walls are in ruin. The gates have been destroyed. The buildings have crumbled. 
and this makes Nehemiah very sad, is so Nehemiah receives permission from his boss to travel back to his home city, Jerusalem. And when Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem, he organizes a team to begin rebuilding the walls, rebuilding the city. And they overcome obstacles and challenges. They face criticism and attacks from enemies, but they persevere through it. And in the end, they finish building the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. The construction's done in 52 days. And after the walls have been built, Nehemiah brings all of the people together, gathers the city together, and he has a grand opening celebration, a grand opening ceremony. Many years ago, I was invited to a grand opening ceremony at the hospital in my hometown. The hospital had moved across town to new property and built this beautiful, large facility. It had state-of-the-art technology inside of it. And I was there at this reception grand opening and is standing inside this large atrium lobby and there were uh, floor to ceiling windows with natural light. At the reception there was live music playing and, and appetizers and drinks and hors d'oeuvres. And I remember the, uh, the board members of the hospital uh, gave speeches and they thanked all the important people. And then of course we had the ribbon cutting ceremony to open the hospital. Now, I don't know if Nehemiah had a ribbon-cutting ceremony, but he had a grand opening celebration. He gathered all of the people together, and they rededicated themselves to God and committed their city to following God. And we read about this grand opening here in Nehemiah 9 in verse 1. I invite you to read this with me. And the people stood up in their place, and they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. So they read from the Bible out loud in the assembly For another quarter of it, they made confession. So they confessed to God their failures and sins and shortcomings. And they worshiped the Lord their God. The people rededicated themselves to God. They committed their newly built city to obeying and worshiping God. And all of this, this rededication, this grand opening ceremony, can all be summarized in one sentence that we read in chapter 10. We look at this one sentence in chapter 10 in verse 39. It says, the people declare, we will not neglect the house of our God. The people have rededicated themselves to God and they declare, we will not neglect the house of God. We will not forget worship. We will not neglect honoring and obeying God. This sounds good, right? If this is the end of Nehemiah's story, this sounds pretty good. That Nehemiah travels a long distance, gets a team, they rebuild the walls, they have a celebration, and everyone lives happily ever after. But that's not the end of Nehemiah's story. Today, we're going to spend our time looking at the end of Nehemiah's story. In Nehemiah chapter 13, the very last chapter of his story. Nehemiah lived in Jerusalem for 12 years. They finished building the wall. They had the grand opening. And for 12 years, Jerusalem had peace and prosperity. Things were good. At the end of those 12 years, Nehemiah needed to go back to his boss. Remember the king. He had to travel all the way back to King Artaxerxes. And so Nehemiah left Jerusalem and went back to his boss. And we don't know exactly how long Nehemiah was gone, but the text leads us to believe that he was gone from Jerusalem for at least a year. For more than a year, he was away. And after being gone for more than a year, Nehemiah travels back to Jerusalem, the city he loves, the city he rebuilt, to see his people. And when he comes back to Jerusalem, Nehemiah is pleased to see that the walls are still standing, the buildings are intact, and the people are thriving. There's trade happening, the economy's good, families are buying houses and moving into the city. It looks good. But there's one problem. The people of the city have neglected to care for their souls. Their souls are hurting. They've stopped worshiping God. They've stopped bringing the offerings and performing the rhythms and practices of worship and praise. They've forgotten their promises to obey God. And their souls are far from him. And we read in Nehemiah's own words how he responds in verse 11. Nehemiah writes, I confronted the officials and I said, why is the house of God forsaken? Earlier we read that the people made a promise. We will not neglect the house of God. And then just three chapters later, Nehemiah says, why is the house of God forsaken? People have abandoned worship, forgotten, and their souls are far from God. 
Has your soul ever felt far from God? Has it ever felt like there's some distance between your heart and the heart of your father? The pressures of life have the burdens of this life created a gap. This last week I heard a pastor from another city share about feeling distance and far from God. He leads a staff of a few hundred people. There's thousands of church members that follow him, and he shared about feeling far from God. And I wrote down some of the comments he made. He shared that the past 18 months have been the worst of my career. And he's asked himself, where is God? I don't, see, I don't sense him, and I feel like I'm hanging on by my fingernails. I too know what it feels like to feel far from God. When my soul feels distanced, when my soul feels hangry, my prayers are empty. My worship is shallow and my mind is sometimes overwhelmed. When I don't care for my soul, my soul gets anxious and irritable. If you can relate to feeling that way, I want to encourage you today. I'm not here to beat up on you. I'm not here to challenge you and say, do better, try harder, uh, suck it up and, and put a, you know, try this, try something new. No, I want to encourage you today that God loves you and he is with you. God knows the obstacles and the challenges that you go through. In this life, you will have pain, we will suffer, we will be disappointed, we will have loss in this life. But we have a hope that is beyond this life, and that is Jesus. Because Jesus died and rose from the dead, we have a hope. And so today, if your soul is hurting, if your soul is hangry, know this, that God goes before you and he comes behind you. He is reaching out to you today to offer you the rest and the peace that your soul desires. So we're going to look closely at Nehemiah chapter 13 today. And in Nehemiah chapter 13, we're going to discover three qualities of a healthy soul. Remember our big idea, God can reform a hangry soul. And in this chapter, we see three characteristics of a reformed soul. So let's go straight to the first one. A reformed soul will reconnect in worship. A healthy soul will reconnect with God in worship because worship is a primary rhythm of connecting to the heart of God. Worship involves praying and involves singing and praising, giving to God and even receiving from God. And when Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem, he discovered that worship had been neglected. The priests had stopped leading the people in worship services. The people had stopped praising and singing. They were no longer performing the sacrifices no one was bringing offerings. It was neglected. In fact, worship was so neglected that corrupt leaders had moved into the temple of God, the house of God, and were living there rent free. Here's what we read in verse 7. Nehemiah writes, I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing a chamber in the courts of the house of God. This guy had an apartment in the temple of God rent free. It was corrupt. Verse 8, and I was very angry, and I threw out all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the cham chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. So worship had become corrupted, and Nehemiah needed to reconnect the souls of the people to God. So he reestablished leadership, he reestablished the Traditions and the practices of worship and offering and sacrifice. He reconnected the people to worship. A couple of months ago, I was traveling in Roatan, Honduras. And while I was there, I got to experience amazing worship with the local churches in that area. One church in particular that we visited is located in a very impoverished community, very poor community. Uh, for example, the families that live in this community live in tiny little houses on stilts high up off the ground to keep them away from the open flowing sewage that flows through their streets. But in spite of these meager conditions, I was amazed to see how the believers in this community celebrated God. They were filled with joy. They were happy. They were smiling. They were not depressed. They were not sad because they had the joy of the Lord. And so we worshiped together in their local community church and while we were worshiping, the people sang passionately. We prayed for one another. And even though most of the worship was all in Spanish and I didn't understand all of it, I felt connected 
to God and connected to those believers. During this worship service, you'll notice in this picture there's a wooden pulpit there at the front of the room, and on it is a wooden cross. And during the service, during worship, a middle-aged woman left her seat and walked down the middle and stood in front of that wooden cross, and she started to sing out loud in Spanish. And I didn't know all the words, but I recognized one phrase that she kept repeating. She kept saying over and over, Mi amor, mi amor, mi amor. She kept singing over and over, mi amor, mi amor, mi amor. And if you're familiar with Spanish, you may know that mi amor means my love. Over and over, my love, my love, my love. She was singing a love song to Jesus. This woman was intimately connected to Jesus. When we worship, we come into the presence of God. We come into the presence of a God who does not judge us, condemn us, but a God who extends grace to us because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And when we come to worship, we lay down our burdens. We leave behind our worries, fears, and insecurities. We come into his presence and we experience his grace and his goodness and his favor. That's what happens in worship. We're connected to the Father. Just a couple of days ago on Tuesday evening, many of us gathered together for a special night of prayer and worship here on campus. And if you were there, you know how we felt the presence of God. We experienced the favor of God. We sang, we worshiped, we prayed. So many of us received more of God's love. Worship is a primary rhythm of connecting to the heart of the Father. So I encourage you to make worship a priority and a rhythm in your weekly lifestyle and in your daily habits. Choose the worship service on Sunday or Wednesday that works best for you. Practice a daily rhythm of praying to God, of singing to God, even while you're driving in the car singing worship music to him. Connect to the Father. Worship is one way that God can reform our souls. So when Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem, he was pleased to see that the economy was going well. Trade was happening. People were making money. People were getting jobs. Businesses were successful. It was all good. The Israelites had a custom in, their, in that day and age, a custom called the tithe. And the tithe was every Israelite gave 10% of their resources to God and to his temple. So if you were a farmer, an Israelite farmer, you gave 10% of your harvest to the ministry of God. If you, were, if you raised livestock, you gave 10% of your stock. If you were a business person, you gave 10% of your money to the temple and the ministry of God. But when Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem, even though the economy was successful, he noticed that generosity had been forgotten. And they were not tithing. They were not giving. Here's what we read in Nehemiah 13, verse 10. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. The Levites were the priests, the religious leaders. So that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. Verse 11. So I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe, tithe means 10%, of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And here we see the second characteristic of a healthy soul. A reformed soul will renew generosity. A reformed soul is a healthy, generous soul. Now I gotta tell you, Generosity is not easy for me. Generosity challenges me. I struggle with generosity. But God is reforming my soul, and I do want to be a generous person. Allow me to share a little bit about my background. I grew up in a family that um, had wealth. We had money. We had resources. We, we, we had money. And when I graduated from high school, uh, when I was 18, I went into church ministry, and I moved out of my hometown, moved out of state to take an internship at a church. And when I made that decision to go into church ministry, I also left behind some of the financial comfort that I grew up with. And I remember my first ministry job was as a part-time intern working at a church while I went to college. And I believe that one paycheck at that time for me was about $300 before taxes. I had a free place to live, but that's what I had to pay for groceries and gas and my cell phone and all those little expenses that I had. I had to stretch. I had to make it work. It was tight. And so there wasn't a lot of margin. And so I wasn't generous. I couldn't be generous. I didn't want to be generous. I'll give you an example. 
At that time, I was about 18 or 19 years old, and I was working with Pastor James, our senior pastor here at Church at the Crossing. And at that time, his daughter, Caitlin, was about five or six years old. And Caitlin and I had a lot in common. One, for example, we had the same snacks. There's not a lot of difference between the snacks of a five-year-old and the snacks of a college kid. And I remember one day, Caitlin wanted one of my snacks, and she asked me if she could have one of my Pop-Tarts. And instead of being generous, I saw an opportunity for an investment. And so I said, sure, Caitlin, I'll give you one Pop-Tart for a whole box of your Capri Suns. You know those juice pouches with the straw? And Caitlin took the deal. It wasn't very generous. It wasn't very kind. And recently, Caitlin and I were reminiscing on that story, and she said, oh, don't be too hard on yourself. You were basically a child back then, too. (laughs) And I asked her if it was okay to share this story, and she said, oh, yeah, absolutely. It makes you look bad, not me. (laughs) So I wasn't very generous. But around that same time, I got a phone call from a young man that I had mentored um, earlier earlier, uh, on. This young man, just like me, had moved out and was living on his own, trying to make it on his own. But unlike me, he was expected to move out. See, his family didn't have much means. They didn't have many resources. And it was expected that when he graduated high school, he was going to have to support himself and get a job and, and find his own place to live. Whereas I chose to move out and go on my own. This young man gave me a call when I was about 18 or 19 years old. And he asked if he could borrow money for his rent. He just couldn't make ends meet that month. And he promised to pay it back, promised to give it back to me. And the money that he needed was just about the same amount as one of my paychecks. And I already told you I wasn't very generous at this time. And God was going to use that situation to reform my soul. And I felt God prompting me to just give him the money. And so that's what I did. I gave it to him, not a loan, just a gift. Because I want to be a generous person. When we walk in generosity, when we practice generosity, we are becoming more and more like God because God is a generous God. Yes, God has given us life. Yes, God provides for our basic needs. But the generosity of God is demonstrated in the cross of Jesus. Our heavenly father is so generous that he sent his perfect son who lived a perfect life to die in our place so that we have a payment for our sin, a substitute for our failings, so that we can be saved and redeemed. So when you practice generosity, you are becoming more like your heavenly father. When we give generously, our souls are being reformed. And I know this may sound strange to hear a pastor talk about giving. Yes, I'm employed by the church. Yes, I receive a salary. And I'm not asking you for money today. I'm simply trying to show you what I see taught here in the Bible. In my family, our tithe is the first thing that comes out of our paycheck, our 10%. And it's not about the amount that we give. It's not about giving much or giving little. It's not about wealthy or not wealthy. It's about generosity. And generosity comes from the soul. And so when I give my tithe, I'm trusting God with all of my income and all of my needs. When we give, we are helping advance the mission and the ministry of God to show the love and the hope of Jesus to others in the world. Just this last spring, a family in our local community suffered a house fire. They lost their whole home in the fire. Their three young kids lost all their toys and clothes and possessions. And our church stepped in to meet that need. We provided uh, short-term housing for them, uh, took care of clothes and toys for the kids until they could get on their feet. And the only reason our church could do that is because of the faithful giving and generosity of the people of church at the crossing. When you give to the ministry of God, you are helping build and grow the kingdom of God here on earth. Generosity is one way that God can reform our souls. So far, Nehemiah has shown us that our souls are reformed through worship and through generosity. And there's one more characteristic that we learn from Nehemiah. A reformed soul will rest. A reformed soul will rest. Resting in God is more than just sleep. Resting in God is more than just a nap or it's more than collapsing into the weekend after an exhausting week. Resting in God is a sustainable, life-giving condition of the soul. 
The Israelites, Nehemiah's people, had an ancient custom they practiced for generations and generations, a custom called the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a 24-hour period at the end of their week on the seventh day where the Israelites rested. They did no work. They did no chores. They ran no errands. They did not work. They rested on that seventh day. And it came from God who, in the beginning of time, created the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested from his work. So the Israelites rested. Now, Israel was different than all the other nations in the world. No other nation rested on the seventh day. No other nation had a Sabbath. They just worked and worked and and grunted and pushed through. And one day rolled into the next, into the next. Only Israel had a Sabbath day. They were different because they were reformed by God to be like him, not like the world. But when Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem, he discovers that they forgot about the Sabbath. Here's what we read in verse 15. In those days I saw in Judah people treading the wine press on the Sabbath, bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys, and also wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. Tyrians also who lived in the city brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem itself. Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this evil that you're doing profaning the Sabbath? The people were thriving. The economy was good. People were successful. People had jobs. People were making money. They didn't see a need. For rest because everything was so productive and efficient. Sabbath rest can also seem countercultural to our culture today. We learn to go, 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 perform, look perfect, achieve, get better, do more. I'm an achiever. I like to achieve goals. I like to work. I, I, that's who I am. But recently, I've been asking myself a question, a question that I want to share with you today. And that question is, what if by trying to be efficient, we lose being effective? What if by trying to be efficient, trying to squeeze everything out of every moment, every day, trying to cram it all in, go, 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 if trying to be efficient, we lose being effective? What if I lose being an effective pastor? What if I lose being an effective spouse? If we lose being effective parents, effective employees, effective students and teammates. On the other hand, what if rest can reform our souls into the people that God created us to be? People who fulfill the calling and the desires that God has created for us. What if rest reforms us for our destiny? I don't do rest very well. I like to produce, I like to execute, and being idle is difficult for me. And so rest, even like spiritual Sabbath rest, is especially difficult. So during my week, Friday is my day off. It's supposed to be my Sabbath day. And I typically do not work on Friday. I I don't check my emails. I don't make appointments. But I'm still busy. I find something to do on Friday. I, I run errands. I do laundry. I clean. I do the projects. I'm go, go, go all day Friday, busy, busy, busy. And then by the end of the day, I'm weary and worn out because I didn't rest. I didn't rest. And so it may sound silly, but I have to remind myself to practice rest. This may seem strange, but I have to tell myself on Fridays, I'm not allowed to do laundry. I tell myself I need to get my errands done early in the week so I can have that day of rest. That's my Sabbath. I know a member of our church who works in the service industry. And they're go, go, go. Do, running shifts and, and waiting tables, serving food. And it's, it's high pressure, high intense. And before this person started following Jesus, they would go, go, go every day, all day. Six, seven days a week. Take overtime, as many shifts as possible. Making money and, and just doing it. After this person started following Jesus... They made an intentional decision to block out Sundays as a day of rest, a day of rest and worship, to attend church, to rest, and prepare for the next week. Now, for some of us, Sunday may not be available to us in our calendar. We've got commitments and obligations. That may just not be a good day for our Sabbath. That's okay. But we can pick a 24-hour period in our week to rest. That's one of the reasons that we have a Thursday night worship service here on campus, to create options for our weekly rhythms. 
And I'm not saying that you need to do nothing all day and stay in bed and close your eyes and meditate. The great news is that we can experience rest through many life-giving activities, connecting with the Father. For some people, it's being outside. It's doing activities like, like fitness, exercise. For others, it's about connecting with close friends and family. I know some people who find spiritual rest in food and cooking, others in music and art. We can find those life-giving activities for us to rest. I can't give you a prescription for Sabbath rest, but what I'd like to offer today are a few simple questions that you can ask yourself. These questions are, first, what activities are life-giving to you? Second, where does your soul experience God the most during the week? And finally, what might it look like to dedicate 24 hours to rest each week? If you reflect on these questions, this is where you'll begin to find a, a, a rhythm of rest. Rest for your soul. Because rest is one way that God can reform our souls. When we look at these three characteristics, worship, generosity, rest, all three of these require faith. They're expressions of our faith. Rest is the faith that God's gonna take care of our needs and take care of things while we're not working. Generosity is faith that God's gonna provide for our income and our resources. And worship takes great faith to trust that Jesus died and rose from the dead to save us. So many human beings strive and overwork to try and earn our way to God and save ourselves. Even Christians can be guilty of trying to impress God with our do-goodism and our achievements and our productivity. But the good news of Jesus is that his death and his resurrection has secured the grace of God for you. It is nothing that we've done. We cannot earn it, we do not deserve it, and we will never pay it back. We can only receive it. And when we receive his grace, we can rest. We can rest from all striving and overworking in the grace of a God who loves you. And so today, in the few moments that we have remaining we're gonna have an opportunity here to rest. Because I'm sure that when we walk out these doors or those who are online, when we stop streaming this video, we're gonna be pulled in different directions, have demands, obligations, commitments. But for these few moments, we're gonna enter sacred rest. I encourage you to be comfortable. You're welcome to close your eyes. But this is a moment for you to center your heart and allow God to re begin to reform your soul. We're gonna have some ambient music and on the screen are a few scriptures from the Bible that you can reflect on. But allow God to bring rest to your soul today. Then I'll return and we'll receive communion.
pray with me? Father God, thank you for the rest that we can have for our soul, for our mind, for our feelings, and for our body. Father, I pray for those in the room and those online who are weary, who are emotionally fatigued. Maybe it's been conflict, stress, or anxiety, or fear, but, but emotionally just fatigued. God, will you renew their spirit? God, for those who are feeling broken physically, in their bodies, in their health, God, we pray for healing and renewal. God, thank you for loving us, and thank you for the hope that we have in your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray, amen. We're gonna receive communion together. You should have received one of these cups when you came in. If you did not, just uh, motion to an usher and they'd be happy to provide one. Uh, Be careful, there's uh, two flaps, two tabs. One opens the wafer, one opens the juice. The wafer represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us. And the juice represents his blood that was shed for us. His innocent life given for our guilty lives. He became our substitute that we may receive grace. So what that means, the good news of God is that no matter your past, no matter the shame, no matter the evil, no matter the regret, the blood of Jesus washes you clean and you are forgiven. So take a moment here to search your heart and in the privacy of your own heart and mind, confess any sin or anything that's between you and God in this moment. God promises us in the Bible in a small book called 1 John in chapter 1 verse 9 he says if we confess our sins God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness so father thank you for the promise of forgiveness and cleansing that we find in the blood of Jesus and thank you for the hope that we have because he rose from the dead and so we receive these elements God with gratitude and with hope because of Jesus Amen. Well, you are invited to receive these elements as you're ready, and we will sing another song together. Atmosphere is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing. Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love. Your
Let's stand together. Sing. The atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. Oh, the atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord. is all around for the spirit of the Lord is here oh overflow in this place fill our hearts with your love your love surrounds us you're the reason we came to For the 
Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. Oh, amen. Well, church. We are a place that loves to pray together, so we would love to pray with you today. If you have any need that's on your heart or would like to pray for something, there'll be prayer partners up front as soon as service is over. Well, this Friday is Trunk or Treat, and we are so excited that we know on this campus there'll be hundreds of kids that are here, not just for candy, but to know that we provide a safe place where they're going to have fun and they're going to see Jesus in us in this event. And so we would love to have you, one, bring your kids, grandkids, neighbors, any kids you can find, ask permission and bring them. Number two is we need a lot of candy still. If you could donate candy, we would love if you could bring candy back today or this week, uh, drop it off over in our kids' area at the desk, and we'll take that all week. Also, we still have some room. We would love to have you sign up to host a trunk. So you can decorate your trunk and have a super fun place for kids to trick-or-treat this Friday night from 6.30 to 8.30. All right, Pastor James has some exciting news for us. Good morning. Well, good afternoon. Anyways, hey, thanks for heading out today. I know it's a really cruddy morning and you guys had to face rain and all that sort of stuff. Thank you for coming out. I got two things for you. Uh, hello, there we go. Two things for you. Uh, number one, um, now, you know, during the, this book of Nehemiah, we mentioned that there was 12 different times that Nehemiah prayed, that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. But, but we didn't do a prayer sermon because we knew that our next series was going to be about how we're going to start drawing the circle, how we're going to start putting those things that are huge on our heart, and we're going to draw a circle around them, and we're going to ask God for big things in our life. And we are going to see God do some amazing uh, works all throughout our congregation. But what we have for you today, um, please, as you head out, go straight to our our uh, Welcome Center. We do have a 40-day devotional for you to pick up. Uh, we're selling them to you at cost. They're 10 bucks a piece. If you don't have the money, just grab one anyways. It's okay. Uh, but uh, we'll be starting this next week, and we're really excited. Um, I know a lot of people, I've personally done this study before, and it, it, it dramatically changed uh, the way I prayed since then. So I want this for you as well. And right now, I'd like to introduce two new staffers uh, as they can make their way up. Uh, this is uh, Christine Aber and uh, David Hughes. Now, Christine uh, is moving from Pennsylvania, and I've known Christine for about 15 years. She has a, a background in engineering. She's absolutely brilliant, uh, uh, one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. She is going to be in charge of communications and um, uh, connections. Now, uh, if I don't know if you've noticed, but we haven't had a communications director for a year. And if you know how to read English, you probably picked that up. Uh, and so we're really excited to uh, uh, to have somebody who uh, is going to be looking at that. If you got the text today, it says, hey, watch out for the exit. She's already on it. Yeah, she's already on it. Yeah. So we appreciate that very much. And um, so Christine has been uh, working hard on trying to find a home. So we're going to be praying for that. Does anybody know about this market around here? It's completely insane. And she's almost had a lot of homes. <laughs> so, uh, so we're excited about Christine. And then this is David Hughes. And David Hughes is our new youth pastor. And David, why don't you tell us a little bit about your family? Yeah. So uh, we just moved here a couple weeks ago from Missouri. So my wife, Brooke, and uh, we've got two little boys. We've got Everett, a three-year-old, which I think you see uh, pictured. And uh, we've got a newborn, Hudson. He's two months old. So yeah, it's a busy, crazy season, but it's been great. Well, we're so excited to have David here. David moved uh, last week, and he sold his house on Monday, bought a house on Friday, did his first youth service, then flew out of town and went to Minnesota to preach at a youth conference and got back in last night and came back in today. So he needed this sermon today on rest. <laughs> now, think about this. We have two people. Let me tell you, it's been the hardest thing on this earth to hire people during a pandemic. Uh, it's very hard. People are not going, ooh, I'd like to be in ministry. Uh, so... Um, and we have two people who moved multiple states over to love you, to serve you, to give their life to you. Can we give them a huge hand? We're going to pray for you. <laughs> oh, 
oh, I love youth pastors. <laughs> They're ready to go. Right, we're gonna, let's pray and commission them. God, we just love you so much, and we just thank you for the opportunity to uh, commission uh, Christine and uh, David. And Father, I just pray your anointing be upon their lives, be upon their ministries. God, melt our hearts with their hearts, and God, we want to bring you glory. And may the work that they begin, and they do, bring many people to Christ. And so, God, we want to uh, see you work through them in and through them. And so, God, we just pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And, Lord, as everyone heads out today, God, I just pray that they are loved and they are reminded that you uh, are in control of their life, that your hand is upon their life. God, we love you and we give you praise and thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Have a blessed week.